Parashat B'Shalach, the shiur is dedicated to all the good people out there who really want to do something good to make a difference in the world and in other people's life. This is Parashat B'Shalach, we're talking about maybe one of the saddest and yet very bizarre and strange events in the history of Am Yisrael. You know, we all know the story of the spies, of the Meraglim, who came in, they were chosen, and they, they came back. And, you know, the story is quite familiar with the spies over there. The question is, why? Why did they do that? Why did they do that? And what does it tell me internally, spiritually, that I can learn from? And hopefully, will not make this mistake. And believe me, there's a lot to learn. So here it is. Am Yisrael, after a year in the desert, seeing the Har Sinai, big production, fireworks, the whole day. Year in the, in the desert, getting ready to move, to come into Eretz Israel. They see miracles on daily basis. Daily basis, all the time. For example, they have a, a uh, mobile well. A, a well that went with them everywhere they went. They were through 40 years in the desert. A miracle of the well of Miriam. Travel with them every single day. It's ridiculous. I think if I see today a, a moving whale, I will be, I, will go, I don't know. I think I'm going to check myself in or something. Huh? <laughs> they show those miracles. Every single day, they had those Ananea Kavod, the clouds of glory, protecting them. Imagine, this is ridiculous. They had the heavenly catering. Every day on the doorstep, whoop, man. Saturday, two portions. You know, at least to get this, there's no more, uh, excuse me, can I have a pizza? Heavenly catering. You don't even have to call, it's there. But Am Israel, regardless of all these miracles, and you'll see something that I keep telling you all the times, miracles do not enhance your emunah, your belief. Miracles sometimes can actually hurt your emunah, hurt your belief. Am Israel so suffers. I thought you're not going to show up today. Finally, uh, we made it, okay. Am Israel so suffers from repression. They, they don't want to become aware of things. They want to forget about the past. And regardless of all these miracles that they see since they suffer from repression, they don't deal with curing their problem. They're repressing their problem. When you repress your problem, you usually tend to forget. But when you forget, you cannot select what is that you're going to forget. They forget everything. They forget the good, they forget the bad. They forget. They forget all the miracles that they see on a daily basis, and they forget how bad it was over there in Egypt. And when you tend to forget, and you don't deal with your issues, there's no emotions, so there is, in a way, only pure logic, so-called. And then we start to do these very strange things. Well, you know, logically speaking, is it worthwhile, worthwhile for me to do that? Logically speaking, let me see, let me evaluate. How really good was it? Let me try to, right? And that's, by the way, one of the things that we do today. Something that's a quite obvious to us, all of a sudden we forget what's good and what's bad, and we go into this like intellectual discussion, and maybe there are signs, and listen, these people are human too. And what's the matter with you? People are killing people, and I'm trying to say, well, you know, maybe it's not, maybe it's us. Look what happened in Sweden. They went in, they rioted. Well, maybe because we don't give them enough. 
And so it's ridiculous. It's unbelievable. Because we try to be very intellectual. No emotions. No emotion. If you're feeling sad about something, well, you work on it. If you're feeling happy about something, you need to become aware. Why am I happy? And then you move on. But when you repress that, there's no emotions. And then it's like everything that we need to do is like, let's talk about it. Let's have a committee. Let's have a, a discussion. And when we do that, we don't deal with the internal work that we need to do, the avodah pnimit. And the avodah pnimit is, for example, if something was bad for you or you, or you hurt in one way or another, both physically or spiritually, you need to take care of the wound. You need to care. Of, you need to take care of your injury. But instead of taking care of the injury, we cut down the limb. We just cut chunks of ourselves, and then there's no emotions anymore. And then the catastrophe starts. And again, if you think about it yourself, slowly, slowly, honestly, you'll see that it's something that we all do, sometimes on a daily basis. It's not so common for me to say that, but the Lubavitcher Rebbe said something that was quite interesting. And he asked one time on the Chet of the Meraglim, the sin of the spies, why they were so afraid of entering Eretz Israel? What was so bad? So he says, it doesn't make sense. Because it says, HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yilachem Lachem, God will fight for you. V'atem Tacharishu, you see the quiet, and God will fight for you. His answer was that they were not afraid of the physical fight of the physical battle, but rather from the spiritual battle. At the desert, they had lechem, bread from the sky, every day. Water from the rock. Protection from the clouds, as we said before. And they were afraid. They were afraid. So if they were afraid, so all of a sudden, wait a minute, in our country, we will have to do what? We have to, build, we have to establish agriculture. We have to take care of the economy. We have to be very responsible about the economy. We have to be a part of society that will be dealt by reality of daily routine of reality. Listen, we don't want that. It takes too much from us. We want to stay in the desert. We don't want to be free. We want to be in a desert, no man's land. It takes a lot of responsibility and internal strength to go and to be responsible for your life. That's why I don't hold a grudge or, or, or uh, I mean, I'm trying to free myself from political agendas. So many people are, oh, the Chalutzim, the pioneers that came to Israel, they were really uh, secular, they weren't religious. I said, listen, that every buffoon can do. But look at what they did. They left everything behind, and they went in, and they were looking to establish. That's why I keep saying all the time, Zionism is a secular messianic movement, to a certain extent. They want to be. Leave me alone. I want my own country. I don't want to be anymore. I don't want any hands on oh, Let me build my economy. Let me build my, my society. Therefore, something very interesting comes up. Therefore, Galut, exile, it's not a, a geographic location. It's not, exile is not a place, a place on the map. Exile, or rather, is a state of mind. That lack of willingness to build to do, to work hard, is the essence of Galut, is the essence of exile. So therefore, ironically, you can live in the land of Israel and be in absolute exile, deeper than the darkest exile we ever been. Because it's not a place on the map, it's a state of mind. 
That's why in a way, it doesn't really make a difference where you are to work, worship Hashem. If you see yourself connected with HaKadosh Baruch Hu to, and free, you're free to do it anywhere. You don't need to worship God or your ability to worship God or to be a servant of God is not determined only by this place or the other. You can do it anywhere. It's a state of mind. What we call the, I mean, people call it like, I, I don't like to use this term. I don't like to use orthodoxy because then that gives legitimacy to other branch of so-called Judaism when it's not. And there, there aren't any other branches of Judaism. And Judaism, either you are a Torah observant, mitzvah observant person, or you're not. And why can I, how can I say that? Very simple. There are many people you can call mommy, but there's only one mommy. Maybe you can call many people mommy sita, but there's only one mama. You know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So there's only one way of Judaism. There's no such thing as a a secular Shabbat. He says, I, I read this most pathetic article in the Israeli newspaper. A guy writes, I want to keep an, a secular Shabbat in Yerushalayim. There's no such thing as a secular Shabbat. Shabbat is only for those who keep it. There's no such thing as a secular Shabbat. So what we call Jewish Orthodoxy or the, the Judaism of mitzvot is the only way, by the way, for a continuation of the Jewish people. And why? Because that is the most demanding way of life that requires you an effort. To be a religious Jew, you need to put an effort in. But that's the, that's the paradox about it. And the paradox is that because it's difficult, because it's hard, it is very precious for those who partake in it. Why? Because a person would not try and try hard for something that he really loves. When you love something, it's not hard. It's not a problem. If you really love your kids, it's not a problem for you to work hard because you love your kids. If you, for example, uh, let's say you want to play the piano, you want to be a pianist, and you love playing the piano. Well, it's not going to be a problem if you to play 8, 12 hours going like this with your fingers. Even if you're having cramps behind your ears from going like this, you're still going to be playing the piano. It's not a problem for you. Or when you're young, in your, in your teens and you like to play the guitar, it doesn't make a difference if you get your cuts and blisters and it bleeds. You're working for something. Look at Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu worked hard for Rachel, and the Midrash tells us that seven years were like seven days for him. He says, it's not a problem. I love it. It's not hard. It's good. But when something comes easy, you don't appreciate it. You don't appreciate it, you throw it away. So if your Judaism is an easy Judaism, mainly, in any case, you're going to throw it away. It's not something you're going to appreciate. And you're going to take it and you're going to throw it behind you. The Gemara tells us, Le fum tsa'ara agra. The more difficult, the greater the reward. The more appreciated. Sometimes it's so, it's so crazy that they make things expensive so you would appreciate them. Think about it. Deliberately, they'll take an item and make it expensive so you will appreciate it. If I make it cheap for you, really, you won't care about it. Work for it. That's right, you work for it. So when you work hard for it, you appreciate it. But the true Judaism is not that Judaism that is only about doing mitzvot or only learns Torah, but is the Judaism that also invests in internal work. It's a Judaism that seeks the balance between or puts an equal part of effort into external and internal work. The combination of Safa and Saifa. 
both of them together. You can't just be spiritual, nor you can only be physical. You have to have both of them together. But let's go back. So this is, the, this is how we started. You see, it's somewhat connected. So now let's go to the Meraglim and see exactly what happened. I mean, these people were not just like regular people. They were Nisiei Aida. They were big people. They were important people. So where did they make a mistake? I know we said some of the things in the morning, but just repeat it for those who were not here. When it says to you, when the Torah says to us what? Shelach. Shelach lecha. Shelach lecha. If you take the words of shalach and you scramble them and you change the order, you get the word chashel. Lechashel means to temper, to harden, to toughen up. Shlach lecha anashim. You have to strengthen the people out. You can't send people to missions like this. You cannot make people individual when they are weak. Shlach lecha anashim. Toughen your people out. If they take the word lecha and you mix the order, you get kol. So you need to toughen all the people. Not only those. Because if the people themselves, if Am Israel was strong, when those people came and said, and they would give us the Dibatar, they would tell those fantasies about the land that were wrong, they would say, what are you talking about? It's impossible. We, we don't listen to you. The people themselves were weak. So Shlach is also Hashel. But Hashel, if you take it, and you also go the word, Chalash, it's weak. You could become weak if you don't do it appropriately. But what's appropriately? Appropriately, lachlosh is not the same as lehachlish. Chalash, who chalash al he dominated the area. When we say, we talk about a post or a fortress, it dominates, it controls over. He has a, a upper view, bird's eye view of the whole valley, sees everything. That's why we need to try to put a, a uh, uh, fortress or post in high places so we can see the whole area. This is what we need to do. And this is the mistake that we make in life. When you are a scout, you need to give us a report of what is happening. A report of what is happening. The Midrash tells us that there was a miracle happened to them, to the Meraglim, to the spies when they went to Israel. And what happened was, all of a sudden there was a plague. Everybody started to die. And the people of the land were busy burying the people around. And they didn't pay attention to the Miraglim that were spying around. There were strangers that looked different. They were spying around. Nobody bothered saying, hey, guys, who are you? What do you do? Can I see your ID, please? Frisk and search, you know. Uh, who are you? Stop and, you know, whatever it is. Stop and shop or whatever, you know. They just went in. The miracle happened to them. But this is exactly where they failed. They chose to deal with the facts. They chose to deal with the disease. My goodness, look at this place. Everybody's dying here. Why is it my call? This is terrible. Why, 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 why? Why, why? It went like this. Instead of saying, wait a minute, look at this. It's so good. For <laughs> their sake, probably like a miracle for us. You can go in. So they dealt with what is happening. Not with the big picture. They dealt with the, with the details and not with the execution of the mission. They failed on the mission. This is what we do many times in our lives. Many times in our own personal lives, we collect data and then we analyze them in a wrong way. Many times, because of our superficiality, we're very superficial. We take fragments of information, and that's a disease that everybody has. Fragments of information, and then we paint a general painting 
or a general picture of what causes why and who did what and so on and so forth and how things are happening. In other words, we are involved in all kinds of speculations and we become just like anybody else. And I don't know if you know, if you're aware, today we have a syndrome. I call it the expert syndrome. It doesn't make a difference what happens. Today in our, in our studio, we have expert so-and-so. He's going to give us a uh, doctor, this expert on ballistics missiles, expert on the weather, expert on this, expert on Home Depot, expert, I, I don't know. Everybody is an expert. Usually all these experts are wrong. You know, to my own, you see those, those buffoons with big egos, and they're arguing about their expertise, and like, a moment of glory in history, they finally got to be on the, 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 the 7 o'clock news, they have nothing else in their lives, there'll be stories they're going to be writing to their great-grandchildren, how they were in the seven, 7 o'clock news, and they were saying something, and give me a break! I'm an expert in this. And everybody here wants to be an expert too. We become experts. The funniest thing, you're going to look at like, especially Israelis, that's like ridiculous. You're going to look at like talkbacks of, of, of articles in, you know, in, in Israeli sites when they argue about religion. Every secular Israeli all of a sudden became a level of a super expert theological rabbi, huge rabbi that knows everything, about, and they have an opinion to say and they argue. You don't even know what you're doing. How can you, for example, argue with me about the spirit of Shabbat, but you yourself don't keep Shabbat, never learned about Shabbat, and for you, Shabbat is barbecuing? I don't understand this. Everybody is an expert. It's a disease. And why is especially Israelis? Because they're Jews, and Jews seem to do it very well. If, if, the, if David will talk about chamber music now, everybody will start talking about chamber. Yeah, I'm an expert in chamber music. Why? Well, this is the music you put, you play in a chamber, you know? And you're going to argue. And you're gonna, <laughs> a, it doesn't make a difference. You're wrong, but you're just going to go on and on because we are expert. Because this is how we are. We don't want to invest in, in long term knowledge, sitting down in a class, taking classes, reading books. Uh, no, I'm just going to pick up my, I read the, the, the headlines and that's it. You know, when I was younger, there used to be such thing as newspapers. Right? You open a newspaper, you have to read the whole article. Today, you just read the headlines on Yahoo or, you know, and you skip to the next one and they go on like this. That's how you get your knowledge. And because of those mistakes that we make and our so-called false expertise, we prevent from doing things. We are preventing ourselves from doing asiyah, from doing things. Why? Because then we say, this is, a, this is the land, this is the promised land, this, is this land consumes its own people. You were wrong, you were looking at things wrong from the beginning. When this is happens, and you hear it many times, you think that your reality, your life are cursed. I don't have mazal, I don't have luck. I have doomed life. Instead of understanding that everything that happens, everything that happens, not only does not happen accidentally, there is a reason why everything happens. There's a reason why we met. There's a reason why I make my choices in my life so I can meet you and you and your parents and my parents and all the way from Adam Arishon. In a way, if you look at it this way, the whole purpose of creation is that we will be here now and talk. No, it's not arrogance. It's trying to give you importance on the moment. Don't let it waste. Don't blow it away on speculations. It's the same thing like the price of, gas, of oil. The price of oil should cost you, I don't know, $10 a, a barrel. But because of speculations today, it's $100. And we're afraid of shortage. Somebody sneezes in, 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 in North Iran all of a sudden. We're afraid of shortage. The price goes to 150. Nothing ever happens. You know how much oil there is in, in South Dakota or North Dakota? You can drink it. You can sell it to the Arabs. But we love this. Because then it puts us into fear. And then it's all doom and gloom. And we end up doing nothing.
We don't understand that not only things happen deliberately. Whatever happens in your life, whatever happens in your life happens for the best. So instead of continue on doing and in action, we wait until all the parameters will sit and all the details will sit perfectly into my picture and then I'm going to make the decision that everything is okay. For example, a person lost his job. So what are you going to do? They're going to sit there feel miserable for yourself? No. Start applying to 120,000 jobs. Sooner or later, you're going to hit something. You're going to find something. But if you're going to sit down saying, Oh, is there any mazal? Oh, my life is so miserable. Oh, yeah. and then you know what happens. Right away, you blame the guy up there. And you end up doing nothing. So you think, you're right. This is terrible. You don't have mazal. But guess what? Mazal, luck. It's not something that you're born with. It's something you create. Every single moment of your life. Or like these people who can't get married. Amen. Why can't they get married? Because they're too picky. Not because they don't have mazal. They're just too picky. Don't be so picky. Because how can you be picky if you don't know what you want? It's, a, it's like the astrologies, right? The, the person who is an astrologist. Like, that's why the Torah Chachamim hate astrology. Because in astrology is, let's go to the astrologers. Let's open the cards. Let's see what the celestial uh, uh, arrangement tells us. It's going to be good on this day. It's going to be good on that day. It's going to be good on any day. You decide it's going to be good. Oh, if you marry on this day, and if a girl has six names and she's missing a tooth in the front, that's going to be a good shiduch. It's going to be, eh, do your b'mitzah gvaniyot. It's nonsense. Is mazal, luck, is something you create. And therefore, everything for us is a fantasy. Is we live in an imaginary world. And if we live in the imaginary world, we want everything to, to fit, and then nothing happens. And when nothing happens in my life, I usually do what? I complain. And sometimes with my crooked interpretations, I'm also on top of all, I'm putting on my own agenda and all battery of fears that I have in me that I've been carrying all my life and feeding it like a junkie. We are motivated by fears. Our fears motivate us. Instead of desire and action to do better. So then what happens, all of a sudden, I become negative, become a negative person, and I'll become such a negative person to the point that many times I would push away even those who want and do good to me. And some people who really want to help me, or some people who really care about me, I'm going to be so negative and so blind that I'm going to make them go away. That's why I need to remember to try to connect to this Yehoshua Binun and Kalef and Beyefune that do exist in me. Maybe we are two out of twelve portion that is good. We allow this ten out of twelve overwhelm us. But don't forget, even if you got lost, even if you feel that this and the ten out of twelve is a majority, you can find this two segments in you that will determine to go to Eretz Israel, where in other words we're determined and committed to, uh, to an action without any hesitation to act, to see things as they are without any fears and without self-interpretation and to act through a complete dedication to the mission by the way, this is why you're not supposed to watch the news. You're not supposed to watch TV. Because the news and the TV is not a report of what happened. Rather, an interpretation, most of the time, based on political and personal agendas of the reporter to what happened. So therefore, you don't get the truth ever. So if so, I don't watch it. And since Bnei Israel accepted the words of the ten Meraglim, the ten spies, and in, even then continued further because they were repressing everything. They didn't want to go 
back to Egypt, they were sentenced for 40 years in the desert, and only their descendants were married to sit down in the land, to settle down in the land. So therefore, you see that your negativity will cause not only damage to you, but also to your children and generations to come. How do you settle down it? Be objective, be positive, and be committed to the mission. You do that, you'll come to the promised land. You won't, you'll perish in the desert. And don't forget, there are no ACs in the desert, and it's pretty hot. So let's connect to being positive, let's connect to an action, let's give for ourselves, let's try to find the good in anything that happens. Even if at the moment it seems bad, let's go on, let's pound and pound and pound until we get what we need to do. The mission is important because the next thing is the man. These are the people who are dependent or around you. And then I'm going to come to the promised land which is the me, of how I want to live my life. So I wish to all Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for coming for our Bar Mitzvah of my son today. And I wish we should share many more smachot together. Amen. Happy and healthy. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Amen.